Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's session. Um, thank you all for dialing in and for your patience and interest in this very interesting topic that we're going to look at on the topic of e-prescribing. So just a few quick domestics before we kick off. Um, this webinar will be recorded. And so please mute your microphones, ensure they're muted throughout the um, talk. Feel free to leave your videos on if you want to. Um, there's no trouble at all with that if you want to. But if you're having any connectivity issues, pop your video off and that should um, inc increase your uh, uh, your width, whatever it's called, bandwidth. <laughs> um, any issues with sound, maybe just check that your volume is turned up on your computer or whatever you're using tonight. And if you continue to have any issue, just maybe try to log out of the call and log straight back in using the same link. If you have any questions as they come up through um, the talk, please feel free to pop them in the chat box and I'll go to them at the end of the talk. We'll let um, Brie keep going through her talk and then we'll gather up all the questions and comments at the end. Um, and just to let you know, we may use some anonymized information from this webinar um, uh, subsequently to the talk tonight. So uh, today uh, we have Brie Ryan, who is the clinical lead in e-pharmacy um, with the HSE where she's been since 2021. And she's currently leading the National E-Prescribing Project. So I suppose her interest in clinical informatics developed from her own firsthand experience in introducing what was a closed loop system for prescribing and manufacture and administration of chemotherapy in the Matter University Hospital, where she had been based for 14 years. Um, she started out in as a pre-reg community and then she moved over to hospital pharmacy and she focused in specifically on aseptics and cancer services at that point. And now is working in clinical informatics um, where she's using, I suppose, technology to really improve um, patient care. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Breed and she will bring us through her talk tonight um, on e-prescribing. So thank you very much, Breed. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you very much for the introduction. I will bring up my slides and put them into presentation mode and you can let me know if you're seeing full screen of my slides now. Lovely. Perfect. Thanks so much, Reid. Fabulous. Well, good evening and thank you to everyone who has come on the call this evening for giving up your time to get an update on the National E-Prescribing Project and to anyone who is listening afterwards. Um, to the recording. Thank you very much also for tuning in. As Ruth said, my name is Breed Ryan and I am the clinical lead for e-pharmacy. And this evening I am going to give you an introduction to the team who are working on the National E-Prescribing Project, go through the vision that we have for it. Um, we're going to, we're going to go through slides on what we have achieved to date, so what we've actually been doing since I've been in post. What's going to happen next? What are the jobs that are coming up for the next couple of months keeping me awake at night? Um, then we are going to look at the opportunities that there are ahead. So um, there's some opportunities coming to even join the National e prescribing team. So I'm gonna blatantly promote those. And then there is plenty of time left, left for questions. And hopefully I'll have the answers for what you're asking me at that stage. So what I'm showing here is first an overview of where I sit within the HSE and where the rest of the project team sit. So the role, the post of clinical lead for e-pharmacy was a new post that was created. Hopefully you can see my mouse as well here. So I came into this post in 2021, which was a new post. And there is one whole time equivalent reporting into that. And it's a contractor through Grant Thornton, who thankfully also happens to be um, someone who has a large experience working as a community pharmacist in their former life before going to Grant Thornton. And we report indirectly to the national director for national schemes and reimbursement. And that is through a reporting line through the chief operations officer to the CEO. Um, when we look, there's um, when we look at the project team, it also encompasses project managers from eHealth. So for the last nine months, Mary Murray has taken on the role of e-prescribing senior project manager. And in the last two months, she has a second project manager working also. So the three or four of us are working full-time on the project with the program manager over a number of e-health projects working. Um, part-time as they're managing several projects. And on the e-health side, the resources report up through the community director, the community health delivery director. And the why was um, fixed before I had to turn off and on my computer coming onto this call, but anyhow. And also to the chief information officer, Fran Thompson. Within e-health, there is access to other resources such as a business analyst who's working with us at the minute. 
and tech expertise from the likes of enterprise architecture. But what we're showing here is the full-time project team who are dedicated working on it at the minute. So I suppose um, the reason why this project has commenced is because medicines are the most common health intervention that we have. This is something you're very well aware of um, and how critical they are to our health system. However, as we can see from the stats shown on the right hand side from a large study done in the UK in 2018, <clears throat> everything isn't plain sailing with medicines all the time. And there have been negative outcomes, a series of death associated with errors during the medication process. And that medication process being from prescribing to dispensing to administration of medicines. So what we want is to use technology to help improve medication safety and reduce these errors to improve the efficiency of the medication process so that people have more time to spend with their patients so that they can have more time to give better care or different types of care to patients. And also quite importantly, to provide patients with access to their medicines information. So this is to empower the patients again by providing them with access to their medicines information. Um, there are many definitions of e-prescribing. There's many things that we think of when we think of e-prescribing. It can actually be all aspects of the generation and transfer of prescriptions for medicines electronically using a dedicated system. And for this reason, the likes of HealthMail, where you're transferring a prescription by email is a form of e-prescribing. Um, but that isn't the end of where we want to be with the National e-prescribing project. So that's where we're going to move on to this slide, looking at the final vision for it. So where we stand today is that when a patient requires medication, the majority of these tend to be prescribed in primary care through GPs. And since the change in legislation during COVID-19, the majority are emailed by a health mail secure email to a community pharmacy. Often the patient won't receive a copy of this in the GP surgery and aren't aware of what is or isn't on the prescription. And our patients, some patients quite, are quite involved in their medication, other patients aren't, but often they were very good at spotting what was missing, what was incorrect on the prescriptions before it, received the before, it before it was received in the pharmacy. When it comes to care settings such as secondary care, it's a bit more mixed in how prescriptions are received by the patient or the pharmacy. Some will go directly by health mail, but predominantly the feeling is that some of these are still coming by either handwritten prescriptions or by printed and signed prescriptions to the patient. Um, if a carer is looking after a patient, then they will often take the place of the patient there to help move the information between the prescriber and the dispensing site. The vision for where we want to get, get to with e-prescribing is that the HSE would have an e-prescription service. This would encompass having a central data repository that would be able to securely accept, store and transmit e-prescribing and e-dispensing dispensing information. This process wouldn't just be a one-way transmission of information. So it means that the GP would be able to send a prescription to the e-prescription service that could be received by a community pharmacy. The community pharmacy would also be able to send their dispensing information. So the record of what they supplied and when will come back to that e-prescription service. So that if the GP wanted to look at a full patient's full medication history to see what they've on, they would be able to see what has been prescribed by all prescribers who are connected to the e-prescription service what has been dispensed by all sites who are connected to the e-prescription service. Similarly, this would apply to not just GPs, but also pre other prescribers in primary care and also to pre prescribers in secondary care. Having empowering patients, giving patients access to their health information and some control over how it's managed is very important. And that's why patient access to the e-prescription service is critical to this project as well. So they can see what prescriptions have been sent for them, who has seen their medication information, so that they can see how many prescriptions are left for them or what has been dispensed. And that is the future state that we want to look for with e-prescribing is that we have that central data repository that can work with primary care, secondary care and community pharmacies. Um, we are human and we can't do everything at once. So there is a look at the evolutionary pathway or essentially breaking this massive piece of work into different phases. Because there is a lot of digitization already in community pharmacies and GPs, we're and because the majority of prescriptions are dispensed there as well and prescribed, we're looking in the first phase to build that core, which contains the e-prescription service and the integration engines and connect it to GPs, community pharmacies, provide access for patients, 
And in line in this, we also need to include PCRS in the first phase, because that is how community pharmacies are paid and it is um, core to all functions. When we go live in phase one, we'll also be keeping very close eyes on what is required for cross-border prescriptions to be shared and the work that's been done in Europe on these. And we'll also be looking to make sure that our data and our information can move and transition those healthcare settings and be used in secondary care also. Um, it's a large body of work to do in phase one, therefore we haven't defined what will be phase two or phase three, whether it's going to be secondary care or the remaining phases of primary care. And we're also aware that subsequent projects when we move through this will need to look at maybe potentially more advanced clinical decision support or the accessibility of a portal. We need to do a lot to achieve this vision and a lot of it focuses around standardization, achieving good data quality, defining the minimum data sets that we need. And areas that we really need to focus on are having a common patient identifier so that the patient can be identified across all systems that are accessing the patient, patient information. The HSE has an individual health identifier. This is one of the identifiers that was used during the COVAX system the, during the COVID vaccinations in the COVAX system. And this is, we expect the identifier that will be used across all systems. This is currently being seeded into GP systems. It, it has been seeded into some ho hospitals already. Um, it's, it has been seeded into some of the PCRS and they're starting to make contact or we provide a detailed contact details for them to community pharmacy vendors as well. So they can, they can start engaging around the process of that. We also need a common medicines identifier so that medications that are prescribed in one system have common information flow that can move between different systems so that we have safe and effective prescribing where the same information is interpreted and displayed and interoperable between systems. Um, a HSE project to develop the National Medicinal Product Catalog is underway and that NMPC, National Medicinal Product Catalog code, will be used as a common med medicines identifier across Healthcare professionals are going to interact with patients' information. So we need to be identified to the systems that we're using. And that identifier needs to be the same identifier that is used across different systems so that the patient can see who has interacted with their medication record. So different healthcare professionals can see who has made, made changes, who has updated, or who has sent through prescriptions. There will be the need for security standards to find minimum security standards. And quite importantly, also privacy standards to define what information different people can see and to ensure that we have got sign off on information governance. So the information we feel should be supplied for the safest prescribing and dispensing of information can be supplied. So these are some of the more difficult conversations that we will need to have with the likes of patients. As often, some patients will move between GPs and move between community pharmacies if they want to maintain privacy. Often this may be in areas of sexual health or mental health. And there is a precedence in some countries where patients are able to hide certain information from their e-prescribing records. When they do this, it means that the responsibility is on the patient if there's any risk because of this, as opposed to the healthcare professional. But the ideal that we would be working towards is that your healthcare professional, being your pharmacist, your prescriber, would have an access to your patient's full medication history to know what they have been prescribed and dispensed in recent times so that we can supply the safest care to our patients. As we've mentioned, we need the technology to be able to do that. So that is a clinical data repository that is able to accept and store this information, that is able to apply the rules for the minimum data sets that are defined of the information that needs to come across and to ensure that the prescriptions that are accepted, stored or transmitted are of that high data quality. This also needs integration capability between different systems. And as we alluded to in the previous slide, we will connect systems in in sequence, starting with GPs and community pharmacies. And the patient access through an app is really important to this project because we want to empower patients again and provide them with digital access to their medicines information. So when we look at that, sometimes it's a bit abstract and this slide is really for people to realize that like what is in it for me or how might it change your practice or how it might change what happens day to day for you. So if we think of ourselves as patients, it means that we would have the ability to use an app to digitally access our health information. 
We'll be able to check and view our e-prescriptions and our e-dispensations. We'll be able as patients to order medicines from our community pharmacies. We'll be able to order a pre-prescription from our GP. And we'd also be able to see who has viewed our medicines information. In terms of our healthcare providers, it means that a prescriber who has the legal authority to prescribe medication will be able to send e-prescriptions to the e-prescription service. We're now moving into an era where an e-prescription should be able to be cancelled electronically. So it means that instead of having to chase the paper piece of prescription and cancel something off it, the prescriptions that have already been sent into that central data repository will be able to be cancelled. That where patients have a change in dose or a change in frequency and there's an existing prescription for it, that that can be amended. And the thing um, that is possibly most attractive to people that we have spoken to to date is that there will be the ability to access a patient's medication list to know what's been prescribed and dispensed to date. And at that very practical day-to-day -day <clears throat> element, it will be that when dispensing a medication and pulling a prescription from that e-prescription core, you'll be able to do that without needing to transcribe from an email or a piece of paper. And it is expected that this would save a lot of processing time of paperwork, particularly in terms of being able to access prescriptions electronically rather than having to print and return them for different processes. To get us to this vision and to achieve this vision, a number of things have taken place so far. So the first of these, when I moved into my post, loads of people were talking to me about governance. I think it was the most common word that I heard around. And sometimes I'm kind of getting tired of listening to it. But governance is really critical to how we get decisions made within this pro within the project. It's how we ensure people are properly consulted and collaborated with. And a governance structure has been established, which we will deal with in a subsequent section. The governance is a project board. So we have taken a high level business case to this project board, which has been approved. And that high level business case has subsequently been submitted through e-health planning in the HSE for approval and subsequently sent to the digital government oversight unit. So this is a unit in the government that needs to approve all technology projects or e-projects for want of a better word so that they can proceed. So we've been approved in principle by the DGOU to proceed. What this means is that we are allowed to go to tender, we are allowed to put up a public go through the public procurement process and find a suitable vendor but we do have to come back to the DGOU before we can actually sign any contracts so that they can sanction us for the costs available. Approval in principle also means that we were able to go to market consultation to get an idea of the range of costs so that's another one of the activities that has taken place and because we have had drafted a high level business case without a lot of consultation. We've also undertaken an early stakeholder engagement. So this was a process to <clears throat> use to get stakeholders views where stakeholders are patients, prescribers and pharmacists on the high level plans so that we can refine them further. And in the background of all of this, there's been a lot of work going on through the National Service Plan to get more resources in on the project so that we can actually start to move more effectively and at better pace. And our National Director, David Walsh, with Damian McCallion, did um, an extremely good job this year and have got approval for some posts as well. So I am looking forward to a few more bodies joining me on the project. What I'm going to show you next is the composition of the project board, which is our current governance structure that is in place. <clears throat> and I'm sure many of you in who are listening have looked at the reporting lines that I showed earlier for myself and my, for my e-health colleagues. And many may have been wondering where was the clinical reporting lines on it. So last year I approached um, Dr. Colm Henry as the chief clinical officer for a clinical representation at quite high level on the project board because we do need that um, high level of clinical representation. So he appointed the HSE's Chief Clinical Information Officer, Professor Richard Green, as the chairperson of the project board. And subsequently, Dr. Colin Henry has also agreed to be sponsor for the project. Um, I would like to thank Mr. Ronan Quirk, the community pharmacist, who has come onto the project board to sit on it as our community pharmacy representative, who's actively in practice. We also have a GP on the project board. And, our hospital and the hospital pharmacists are represented through the chief pharmacist for the acute hospitals drug management program. And um, while we often think about ourselves in terms of the users, patients are critical to this project as well, and they're core to everything that we do. 
So we have three patient involvement partners on the project board. Um, we, I have started up an engagement through the National Patient Forum to look for patient involvement partners. And the National Patient Forum have um, they've quite a developed process in place. So I am able to submit an expression of interest to them and that will go out to all their patient partners. So they have a number of organizations that work with them and they have some patients on their National Patient Representative panel. So back in, I think it was about April last year, we went out with an expression of interest. And at that time, we planned to have two patient representatives on the project board. Um, within about 24 to 48 hours, five people came back interested to take part in our project board. So at that point, given the level of interest, um, I agreed to increase the number of patient involvement partners on the project board up to three. And we met with five people who came back and had a lovely discussion with them. And we agreed what three would go on the project board up front. And two of the other people who had come back with the expression of interest um, felt that they would be quite interested in some of the later stages of the project and were happy to wait until then. In terms of operational representation, there is a member from the PCRS um, with Linda Fitzharris. We have representation from the National Contracts Office, the Assistant Chief Financial Officer, and the National Director of National Schemes and Reimbursement. This is an e-health project as well, so we need technical representation on the project, and that is provided through the Delivery Director for Community Health, the Head of e-Health and Information Policy in the Department of Health. HICWA has supplied um, a member of staff to act as an observer rather than someone who has an actual say on the project board. And then we also have the National Director for Operational Performance and Integration who falls into the other um, category. So that is the composition of our project board and that's the governance structure that we have in place at present. And I must say, it is I must acknowledge the time and effort being put in by the project board. And I think um, commend the attendance as I think we've had near, almost full attendance at all of our project boards. So it shows the importance that this project is for people across the HSE and the interest that there is. And I think we can see that also from the number of participants that there is there online this evening. One of the pieces of work I mentioned earlier was the early stakeholder engagement. And this was something that the project board was quite keen to undertake to make sure that the early plans that we had met with people's needs to identify any gaps um, as something that would inform us to refine our high level business case into a more detailed business case. And also something so that we could understand the barriers. So what might be the barriers coming up for people? So the early stakeholder engagement that was planned, um, we looked at different options of how to do it. Um, and in the end, we chose to meet with people face to face and try and get some qualitative analysis first. So we invited a small amount of people to come to face to face meetings. And then we did qualitative analysis on the information that we received on those meetings. They were some of the slides I showed you earlier, where we went through the three main questions of what do you see to be the benefits? What are the features that you would want now or in the future? And what are the main barriers that you would see? We took the information that we got from the three different groups. So we met patients separately, we met pharmacists separately, and we met prescribers separately. And then we brought that information back into a questionnaire, an anonymized questionnaire that was sent out to all participants. And then we, we took the themes and we asked people to rank different themes and come back with comments and questions. So this was a way of providing the feedback from everyone all at once and getting people to go through a second round and say what they thought was most important from it. So I'll show you the results of this work now. And um, the work has been formally published and circulated and we are just waiting for it to be published live on the eHealth website under the e-prescribing page. So anyone who's interested in reading the report in more detail will certainly be able to access that through that page. Um, hopefully in the coming days. So we carried out eight of these face-to-face -face early engagement sessions. We had two with patients, we had three with prescribers and we had three with pharmacists. And we have 44 participants attend. These meetings were held from six to half seven in the evening because we needed a decent amount of time to get a good conversation generated. And we were conscious that a lot of um, the healthcare professionals are in work during the day and it's very hard to get out of work and attend these meetings. And often for the likes of GPs and community pharmacies, it's at a personal cost as well to attend meetings. Um, and another reason for the evenings as well, it was, it was particularly during January and February when there were quite serious demands on the health service at that time. <clears throat> Once again, we went back to our national patient representative panel and we went to the national patient forum to look for patient representatives. 
and um, we contacted relative relevant organizations for prescribers and pharmacists and we also went to a couple of individuals to increase the numbers so we looked for the likes of icgp imo the irish hospital consultants association we looked for some of our medication safety colleagues and dentists and then on the community pharmacy side we looked for representatives from community pharmacy and um, some individually and some through the ipu and thank you very much for the ipu for spreading the word on that we also went to individual, we looked for hospital pharmacists and we did this on a bit of a geographical basis so that we could get a mixture of hospitals that had e-prescribing or didn't have e-prescribing. We looked for a mix of public and private hospitals as well. We contacted the Association of Hospital Pharmacy Technicians for some representatives and some came through the IPU as well. PCRS were representative, um, our regulator, the PSI was represented as were our medication safety representatives through the Irish Medication Safety Network and our HSE med and medication safety colleagues. Um, during the process, we found some groups didn't respond, other groups responded really rapidly. Um, obviously being a pharmacist, I suppose my contacts with the pharmacy side were a little bit better than those with the prescriber side. So there was a slightly la longer lag time for notifications, I think, to get down to prescribers on the ground, which may have affected their attendance. There was a really high attendance by pharmacists and during the meetings, there was really, they were fast moving and um, really interesting meetings, really informative meetings and really positive meetings. Our group size ranged from two to 10 participants. The aim was to have five or six participants to allow for inclusive conversations and allow for a bit of drop off. So we got it, we got it right in one or two meetings and we we're over and under in some others. But the duration and the number of meetings seemed to be appropriate as we we're starting to get the same information through at the end of them. Um, <clears throat> unlike, um, focus groups we did use a more flexible approach to the planned questions and um, some of the patients were really eager and they'd looked at the slides in advance and there was just an open discussion rather than formally going through the questions and we also met with the patients first and often used some of the feedback that we had from the patients into the later meetings so we were, didn't strictly stri stick to only asking three questions we did use some of the information from the earlier meetings to bring to the likes of our prescribers and pharmacists and to get their reactions on that so when we consider the results that we see, we do need to remember that there were 44 participants in the face-to-face -face meetings for the qualitative feedback. And then when we went out to do the questionnaire, there were 27 responses. So it's an indication of how people feel, but it's not, um, it's not representative. There's no p-values coming out of this due to the large number of people that we had involved is maybe the best way of explaining that. The themes that came out of this were that um, people want e-prescribing and they want it quickly. Um, that our stakeholders being pres prescribers, pharmacists, patients are really interested in getting this. But there were some words of caution for people to say that when we look at standardization, that it is it's a very valuable tool, but we need people to understand why, why we have to put that work into, into standardization so that they can see the benefits. Overwhelmingly, patient safety was the biggest theme that came out of this, with people wanting to be able to give safe, better care to their patients and have more access to information so they can give the best possible care. Um, the stakeholders we spoke to were really interested in being collaborated with, with being consulted with, with being involved in the process so that we can get the best possible solution for everyone to work with. And I think that's really positive as we look to move forward to the next stages of the project. We do need to do a lot of work around the data ownership and there was there was some questions, particularly when we moved to some of our patient groups about what information could be seen, what wouldn't be seen, what controls would be over it. An obvious area were the efficiencies that were going to come from this and also concerns and conversations around the privacy, both the medical situation, people may want personal privacy in different situations. So that's a very small snapshot of the quotes that came out of the qualitative analysis. The report has a lot more quotes through it and a lot more of the themes to look at. We use these quotes to ask a number of questions during the online questionnaire. And we gave the following seven statements to all the participants in the questionnaire. And we asked them to rank them in order of one to seven of which they thought were most important benefits of e-prescribing. And when this happened, um, the participants came back <clears throat> And patient safety came out as on all of these, some of them were very close together, but the first two or three would always be around patient safety and they tended to come out more importantly than efficiency gains or other type of gains. Um, I'm not going to read through all of them there, um, it's probably not good use of our time, but um, 
it is it's 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 interesting to see that the safety element was what was most important coming out through all of them. This came through as well when we looked at the features of e-prescribing for patients once again. And um, the feedback was that the most important thing was that patients could see their list of prescribed and dispensed medication. And this comes back to campaigns that our colleagues in med safety have been pushing with the no check ask campaign, that WHO campaign is how important it is for patients to know their list of prescribed and dispensed medication. We can see how successful this is. Some of them are feasibility ones and others are patients want to be able to document the medications that they take. When we look at these results, we should remember there were a smaller number of patients involved overall compared to healthcare professionals if we join prescribers and pharmacists. So when we interpret these results from the questionnaire, we do need to remember that they are predominantly probably from a healthcare professional. And probably two thirds of the respondents were healthcare professionals and one third were patients. Once again, when we asked about features of e-prescribing for healthcare professionals, that idea of being able to see what patients medicate, what, what medications patient were, patients were on came out highest. And a lot of this is coming from the challenges and the risks that are seen when patients transition from healthcare settings between primary care and secondary care and back from secondary care to primary care. And this particularly comes out when we look at the features for healthcare professionals around being, including the indication for medications, the ability to include reasons for stopping or changing medications. We wanted to understand the barriers to e-prescribing so that we can plan for them and try and mitigate for them as much as possible. And we gave people only the option to only mark one of these as what they felt was the biggest barrier to e-prescribing. So they were all fairly, they, there wasn't a huge difference between a lot of them. So they came out as being process change, education and training and technology literary being the highest ones. And we also need to acknowledge the idea of trust that uh, you know, an effective solution can be delivered and the risk of system breakdown were also potential barriers there as well. And the final slide from that early stakeholder engagement that I was going to show you this evening as well was with the idea of being able to access a medication list and see medication from different prescribers and different dispensing settings. We asked the question of who should have access to a patient's medication list. And it's quite reassuring when we look at this that between prescribers and community pharmacists, if we combine the agree and strongly agree, it's an overwhelming agree that prescribers and community pharmacists should have access to a patient's medication list. This is certainly mimicked with our nursing colleagues and our pharmacy technicians, particularly when you agree when you join the agree and strongly agree that their roles are strongly recognized. And then as we move into, and I think this is an area we will need to address through our training as well and our education process is the roles for other staff and GP practices and other trained pharmacy staff around the desired role for their access to patients' medication list. So I think that might be the last slide on the stakeholder engagement that we have. But as I said, the report will be available on the eHealth e-prescribing page um, in the coming week, I hope. While we were looking at that early stakeholder engagement, um, Mary Murray, the project manager, was leading out in a market consultation. And the purpose of the market consultation was to look and see whether <clears throat> before we went into a formal tendering and procurement process, we decided to do this optional step and it was to put out a high level outline of our requirements to the market and invite some or all of the respondents to come and show, show their technology. Um, the purpose of doing this is to see, are there actually technology solutions in the marketplace? So rather than going out blind, we're able to see were there vendors in the marketplace that will be likely to come through in a formal procurement. Um, by getting a feel for the number of vendors available and the variety of offerings in it, it gives more information for deciding on the type of procurement approach. And there are a number of types of procurement approaches that can take different amounts of time. They're structured slightly differently and they need different levels of participation by the project team and other people who are on your procurement evaluation group. It was a way of identifying the market interest and it was also a way of getting rough ideas of costs and time scales. And costs and time scales are important because at the scale of e-prescribing, it isn't going to be cheap. And there are certain review processes within the HSE and within the government that may need to be complied with depending on the cost. And um, particularly, so these are ideas of peer review where there are independent bodies checking on the project to make sure things are being done appropriately, that it's right to spend the money that we're going to spend on it. And it was also a way of meeting vendors who have 
actually done this work at, on a similar scale in different markets and to get really good information from them. The vendors that came during the market consultation were really open to telling us what worked well, what didn't work well. A lot of them had information on rough timelines that they'd used. And they were also quite good in sharing learnings around their standardization and their data structures or standards that they had to apply. So the, the market consultation process is almost closed out. And um, one of the vendors we met want, wants feedback. So we'll be formally closed out within the next week. And that combined with the early stakeholder engagement is giving a lot, us a lot of work to inform our planning towards procurement. So this brings us to where we are now and what needs to happen next. And the next steps are that we have we have a governance, we have a good governance and structure in place. But now we need to develop that governance structure further to build in the collaboration and consultation structures. So this is where we're going to be taking more detailed information and we need to have a larger body of stakeholders involved because at the minute, as you can see from our project board, there is a small amount of each type of representative there. So we need to bring back, we need to bring together larger groups of representatives we're going to be prepared to make decisions and recommendations around what the future is for e-prescribing, what we prioritise or what we don't prioritise within e-prescribing. Um, so we are actively working on, the, on starting off this expanded governance through the likes of working groups, and that is the next most important thing that we need to achieve. Concurrently, we, are, we have developed process maps of how the current workflows are. And we're currently meeting with the vendors to look at how, how the data matches those workflows. And when those process maps are finished, they will come back to that, those type of working groups, which will have the larger amount of stakeholders there to say, this is correct or it isn't correct, it needs to be tweaked in terms of what we have. And they will be used to, as a basis to inform what information is available for the future processes that we agree on and what data flows and data gaps that we have. Along with this and aligned with this, um, we are putting together the draft requirement specifications that's needed for tender. So these are the things that we are obvious we know need to be included. Um, they will need to be reviewed by our working groups, by our project board and our procurement evaluation group. But the work has started to build the structures for those, build the templates for them and start building them out. And all of this will lead us into procurement where a formal tender will be published, where responses will come back and a vendor will be selected for the central data repository and the integration services and the patient app. And it will also define in procurement the requirements of what needs to happen for the vendor systems and what changes they need to happen and how they, that can be established. So it's no mean feat, the work that is ahead. Um, it makes it look kind of simple on that slide there when I look at it myself, um, but there is a lot of detailed work going into it. And we are looking to move consistently and keep progressing as we started um, so well in the last 12 to 24 months. So where that leads us to next is a discussion around the upcoming opportunities. So while we're going to need representative and participants in working groups, we're also looking for some staff to come in and work on the National Prescribing Project. So we're very lucky through the service plan, which is how the HSE gets resources to have got approval for two chief pharmacists to come into the project and one senior pharmacist. These are whole-time equivalents, so they're full-time posts and they're permanent whole-time posts. So I'm hoping that some of the people listening on, on this call or some of your colleagues, if you're interested, will you let them know about these. Um, the jobs are going to be advertised through the HSE jobs website and people can register on the Career Hub for notifications about the posts. I expect that the Chief Pharmacist post will be published very soon. Um, it is going to be a combined campaign for Chief Pharmacists also for the National Medicinal Product Catalogue. So when the advert comes out, it is going to say that there are multiple posts, but I can confirm that either there is approval and funding for two full-time posts within the National E-Prescribing Project. So if you're sitting there on the call and you have more than five years experience as qualified pharmacist, and you're interested in the area of improving safety for patients, bringing along e-prescribing and thinking some of the skills in the area. Um, please do keep an eye for jobs that are coming out. And once the job is advertised, I will be listed as the point of contact for any questions that there are about the job spec. So please feel free to get in touch. And similarly, if you have a senior pharmacist and you're looking for a bit of change or something different to do as well, 
senior pharmacist will be someone who has three years post-qualification experience. Um, it's trying to think and see if you're interested in a change. There's availability of one post coming up and that is likely not to be advertised until later in June, just as some of the paperwork is being processed. Um, for colleagues who might be working within the HSE or know people working within the HSE, we're also looking for some administration grades of a grade five project support. That post is due to close tomorrow. And there's grade five data analyst post that is due to be advertised soon. And we're working through job specs for some prescribers as well, and look, we'll be looking to advertise those posts. So it's a really exciting time for the National E-Prescribing Project. A lot of work has happened with a very small team working on it, and we're hoping that as soon as we can get more people in, we'll be able to move a bit more quickly on everything. And essentially the time is coming now where it's looking to you to have more input on it. It's to establish those collaboration and consultative processes with yourselves as prescribers who are going to be using e-prescribing. And I think from my experience as well is that patients are critical to this process. Um, I have found working with the National Patient Forum to be very effective. We have a lot of very engaged patients that are interested there. So if you do have any patients coming in out of your pharmacy or in or out of your hospital setting, and you feel that they will be able to contribute to, I, to projects such as e-prescribing, or there could be other projects, some of them happen in areas of dental care, anywhere to do with the HSE, it is worth maybe referring them to the National Patient Forum and the HSE. There are two staff there, Nicola Williams and Mila Whelan, and they're their link point for any patients who want to get involved. And like I did, expressions of interest come up and there's opportunities for patients to get involved and maybe go on a project board where you might meet once every six weeks, or there might be small pieces of work where they want to come, them, come to a half day workshop and contribute along those lines. So it's an interesting opportunity as well if you have patients that you feel will be engaged and interested or looking for something to do in that health space as well. So essentially we're at the point that the broken down car is starting to be pushed. It's getting a bit of momentum and hopefully very soon we'll be sitting right behind the, the steering wheel and moving at pace. So that is kind of what I have for you this evening. I might finish up there and stop sharing my screen and I'll pass it over to Ruth to see um, if there's any questions or comments that have come through. Thanks so much, Bree. That was really insightful. Thank you so much. We're all dying to know what was happening in that space. So now we're all fully informed. So we appreciate the um, information and the update of where things are at. You've done a Trojan amount of work, but you can see there's a Trojan amount to go yet. Um, and it's great for those opportunities for pharmacists to come in and join your team and bring their skill set um, into the HSE, um, which is a great opportunity. If anyone has any questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, for now, Brie, there are a number of questions and I'll put them to you there. Um, so uh, there's a question there on, obviously, a lot of our patient cohorts are older patients. How do you plan to support um, patients, um, older patients in particular, working with that kind, kind of technology, such as apps, etc.? What do you have a plan for around that? Um, interesting. We had when we had our early stakeholder engagement, it was one of the questions that we focused on a lot was what about the older population? Who do you think might not be interested in it? And some people felt that, you know, they felt this population's like as someone used the example of you, a pregnant Ukrainian refugee has come has come into the country. Is this something that just makes it harder for them to get get their prescription or how do we deal with it? And some people, like one of our members of our project board who would be I would, you probably would classify him in the elderly category as well. He felt a lot of these people would be quite engaged. He was like saying maybe 20% of his kind of cohort wouldn't be. But actually that's one of the benefits of having some of the patients on the project board is they have actually access to some of those organizations. So he had different of the Age Action Ireland have different education campaigns. They've run different campaigns with people and they've information on what to do and how to get the information through to them more frequently. Excellent. Um, next question, all this data you're going to be collecting, um, are you going to maybe look at um, reporting maybe on medication usage, different prescribing habits? I think the NHS does a lot of that. Will you be able to utilize this data in that manner? And um, the secondary use of data is very important. So as part of that, you know, as part of our scoping, we do need to see who wants to use it and for what. And that will be part of our governance structure as well as decide what information can be used for those reporting structures, what is appropriate, what isn't, who should receive it and who should not receive it as well. So I suppose if it's reporting for healthcare uses, if you look at any of the, um, the questionnaires that have gone out through the likes of IPOSI, one of the patient organizations and HICWA, they've actually done good patient consultations. And patient groups feel it is appropriate to use 
information like that for secondary uses where it's going to benefit the health service. Um, if it was to go out to the likes of pharma, I don't think people would agree with it. And that would be where there would be a line between it. Or, and research is probably something that's a bit different. But I would certainly hope that the information will be able to be auditable for secondary uses that are in line and have been approved for um, appropriate healthcare uses. And as you mentioned the word research, <laughs> a number of my colleagues are on the call tonight um, and have asked me, is obviously there's huge potential here for research and would you be looking to to move that into that space just from a patient outcomes point of view could really get into the nitty-gritty of it if you had that much data and um, we probably have to look to the likes of the health information bill which is starting to move i think there is a the initial draft well the the outline of the health information bill has gone to the government and i think we would take information to take some guidance from the health information bill as well because they are looking at structures around that to the best of my information um, so research up front, I haven't thought about a huge amount. And um, if we can get the, fir the first uses of it there, it's the most important part really to get out is to get the basics out. But um, I think in general, when you look at the likes of the Caldecott Guardian and things in the UK, I think research has often been dealt with separately to those audible direct healthcare uses of what are we prescribing? Where are we prescribing it? You know, the likes of AMRIP uses for their antimicrobial resistance. Okay, very good. And will this new system integrate with the um, electronic health records that are there? And for example, would pharmacists be able to get access to primary diagnostics, you know, lab results, imaging, et cetera, et cetera. So we'd have a, a better picture of the patient in front of us. So we're, the this isn't an EHR project, it is e-prescribing. So we're looking to move the e-prescribing information. So I would say upfront lab results is not part of this. It depends what the date, the, if you look at the, say the HICWA, 2018 guidelines on what should be your minimum data set for an e-prescription does include the likes of indication. So then it comes back to decisions of does indication become mandatory for every prescriber to fill in? That's one of the questions that we brought up through our early stakeholder engagement. And certainly there was feedback that GPs might find that very difficult to do at that scale. But the items like having indication, is it optional, is it mandatory, is coming back to what is the data set for a prescription? And the items like indication would be part of that I would expect and that will need to be agreed through that consultation process but access to labs through our system is not 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 in scope right now. Okay and is there flexibility in the system for patients if they're going to different um, if they're going to different pharmacies that the system would be able to cope with that if they go for you know their LTI in one pharmacy and their GMS in another pharmacy? Um, we haven't we haven't outruled one way or the other. I do believe that there are different types of patients around if we consider our patient cohorts. Some people will move around pharmacies, younger people will want a choice. Other patients will want to go to the same pharmacy all the time. So I think we will need to accommodate patient choice. If you look at the likes of the NHS, there's an option of a nominated route where your prescription always goes to the same pharmacy. So if you think of our nursing home patients, that's something that is very convenient for them. It's something that's convenient for the people caring for them but other people may want the choice to be able to direct theirs using an app. So it's a case of accounting for it when we think of our older patients, is that a decision that just needs to be made once for them so that they don't need to keep fiddling with the app and having potentially the stress if they're not, if they don't like it, if they're not happy with it, but also have the ability to change it easily themselves. So, because some people want to be able to change the pharmacy if they feel it's more convenient to go somewhere else, maybe without having to tell the pharmacist to their face yeah. that they don't want to come anymore but um there does need to be some flexibility of choice for people and the idea that you could nominate or have a choice to go um is important okay and how about controlled drugs how will they work in an e-prescribing system well thankfully um <clears throat> i think the like health mail and the emergency legislation has i think helped an awful lot because i think the thoughts before in a lot of countries when e-prescribing came in, controlled drugs weren't included. I think we have quite a good precedence in that they were included in the electronic transfer of prescriptions with health mail. So we're working towards including them as well and not ex excluding them as a particular type of medication that wouldn't go through e-prescribing. And if you look at some of the comments that came back and certainly things through the Department of Health, the overuse of controlled drugs and I think the abuse of controlled drugs in places is kind of one of the areas where there could be a lot of benefits from that oversight of e-prescribing. So I think they're one of the classes of drugs that are probably most important to have in there. And when we looked, one of the slides that I didn't bring up um, on the early stakeholder engagement was when we asked people, should there be mandatory 
e-prescribing and we asked it in three ways of should there be mandatory e-prescribing for control drugs we asked should there be mandatory e-prescribing for high-risk drugs and we said should there be mandatory e-prescribing for all medications and the responses were a yes generally around 78 percent for each of the categories Okay, here's one just relating to veterinary prescriptions. Um, I don't know if it's outside of your, your scope, but the question being, um, is there any consideration of joining up with the National Veterinary Prescribing System, which is in place for vets now, and linking that in, or is that outside your scope at the moment? That is definitely outside the scope. Okay, outside the scope. <laughs> um, another question is that... Um, are we are is there any communication going out to like doctors and consultants, dentists, etc., who are emailing prescriptions to patients to print off to let them know that this e-prescribing is coming down the line? Um, so I suppose our first kind of mass consultation or that has happened has been, I suppose, slowly through the early stakeholder engagement has happened. We are engaging, we meet with ICGP regularly on a six-week basis and kind of from their representatives their feeling was to wait another while before they had some mass consultation going out. So at this point, as we, we're getting to the point now, and I suppose one of the reasons why last year I was asked to do a similar presentation and we didn't have good enough or more advanced enough plans to come out and actually meet with people. So we are looking to improve and start moving up in the communications. That's one of the reasons why the posts coming in, some of our great vibes, and there's one post waiting approval is around the idea of a communications, a communications expert because there's large scale communication across here. And when you're doing something, it's very easy having come from a hospital where I worked about e-prescribing in chemotherapy, where we had a very small amount of prescribers. We had a, a controlled enough amount of nursing staff and a controlled amount of pharmacy staff. When you move to the scale of nas national projects, it's controlling where and when our information is circulated out to make sure we've ever consulted properly is quite important. Okay, so on photo what you're saying, obviously, we can see that you you just in the very initial stages of what you're doing. And there's obviously a huge amount of work to go into getting to the, the finish point of where you're getting to eventually. How, how far out is that? Is that a two, three, four, five year guesstimate? I appreciate it's not months. It's, it's not months is what we're going to say. Um, we're working through project plans. And once we get an idea of what procurement process we're going to be in, which we will work to, I think, in the next couple of months, we'll have a better idea on timeframes. But it is it's too early to mention a time. Although I think when the politicians during the week said something we done by Christmas on having scanned barcodes on it, Ossian Smith and the Independent. But he hasn't been talking to any of us. So um, <laughs> somewhere in the media, they're going to say Christmas was the deadline. But um, yeah, that was done yeah. without so A few then. years down the line, yeah. Very good. Um, and then is there any sign of, just for Medrex um, in acute services, um, would there be a facility for them? Or do they have to wait until phase two of the rollout for that? Well, one of the reasons of including the patient app really early on is so that like the one common denominator between primary and secondary care is the patient. And I suppose we do need to acknowledge the majority of patients do present in some coherent manner, like they're not all coming in on a stretcher, unable to talk as well. You know, some of them will, it will be a problem. So that is one of the reasons why we felt it was really important to keep patients up front and give them access because then they can provide their medication list through their app to, to secondary care. But for now, um, we're, we haven't considered whether a portal needs to be present up front for secondary care. But for now, we're looking that the patient will be that common denominator and be able to provide it. OK, and do you envisage that the e-prescribing system will replace things such as the high tech hub and the different hubs that we access currently in community setting? I don't know. I just need to. We need to. There's so much we need to do with the first part. I haven't thought about conquering anything else. I've just thought about setting <laughs> up the basics of what we have. But um, we're engaging regularly with the PCRS and I think there's really good work on into the high tech hub and there's an awful lot of development that's gone into the high tech hub so right now with our engagement with PCRS is that we're looking we're working with them closely we're keeping them well informed and making sure that they can access prescriptions so the big thing is that prescriptions wouldn't need to be printed off anymore don't need to be sent back to the PCRS so that by having a code or an identifier for each prescription that moves across the services so having a code for your prescription that matches to your dispensation, that that can be accessed by the PCRS. And that is where we want to go. Um, I don't have any plans to necessarily overtake anything that the PCRS is doing. I think they have a very established workflow in place. 
Okay. And why did you choose the NMPC rather than the ATC for your reference, your meds reference? Um, I don't think the ATC goes down into enough detail. Um, okay. But I think Shane Burns is on the phone there. Um, I think Shane, said, uh, who is the clinical lead for the National Medicinal Product Catalogue, is there. So he could probably answer that question an awful lot better than <laughs> I can. Very good. Okay. Um, if anyone else has any questions, you want to pop them quickly on the chat. If not, we might wrap you up. We've three minutes left to go. Um, Grace, I might get you. Oh, hang on. Oh, well done. Thank you. Uh, I might get you to pop up those slides. Too. Thanks, million. So um, thank you so much. We have popped a quick link in the chat box there. If you wouldn't mind taking the few seconds before you hang up the call to complete that, just to give us some feedback on um, tonight's session and any suggestions for any future sessions. We'll remind you again, as part of your CPD, it might be worth um, taking a few moments now while it's still fresh in your head to commence or start the first few steps um, in your reflective cycle, in your CPD, in your e-portfolio. And we'd remind you that we'll be having more of these in conversation with sessions. And our next one is going to be on the 7th of June. And there we're going to be um, talking with Leonie Clark and she's going to be looking at the Falsifies Medicines Directive. Um, we're a year in and we've come to the end now already of the use and learn, though I think still learning but anyway end of use and learn now for fmd and on to the next steps and leone is going to um uh be our person in conversation with so brief it's been lovely um having this conversation with you tonight thank you so much for all the information it's great to see where it's going and it's good to know that there is a future and it's, it's going to happen um which which is lovely to see and we'll all take heart in having less paperwork in our lives um <laughs> whenever this comes down the line so Thank you all for dialing in. Thank you for your time. Please complete the um, survey and uh, if you take a moment to do your CPD. Thanks everyone. Good night. Thanks, million. Thanks, Ruth.